What's up guys, it's your favorite Kiwi Coach. In this video, we're doing part two of Matthew Wolf's Golf Swing, talking about the concept of matchups. This particular video, we're gonna be talking about ground reaction forces. So, let's go do this thing. Matt, you hit it really far. Club at speed, what it was like, 125 to 130 even, possibly? Yeah. At times? Yeah, he's kind of up to 33 here with me. And he does a lot of things that you <laughs> he like. He, he, he does a lot of things that you like to create speed. So welcome back to the channel, guys. If you guys are new to Kiwi Golf Japan, we do a bunch of videos like this every single week. So go ahead, hit that little red subscribe button down there. Maybe hit that like button while you're down there as well. And let's hop into the next part of this video. So before we hop into the video, I just want to let you guys know we do have an upcoming seminar on the topic of matchups. It's going to be at Grand Age Golf Club in December. So what I want you guys to go do is go ahead and hit that little link in the description. It's going to lead you to a Google Docs form, which you can then fill out and sign up for the seminar. This particular seminar, we're only going to be having 10 spots per day. We want to make it a lot more intimate, a lot more personal. So make sure to go ahead and sign up for it now because they're going to be going very, very quickly. But now let's go hop in and start talking about ground reaction forces. So before we hop in and start analyzing Matthew Wolf's golf swing, let's give you a basic example of what ground reaction forces really are. So ground reaction forces are when you apply a pressure to the ground and then the ground applies an equal or greater pressure and then it creates some type of movement. Now with swing catalysts, what they typically measure is vertical ground forces, a horizontal ground force towards the target side, or a torque or rotational force which allows the body to rotate. Now, the interesting part about swing catalysts is now we can actually measure when these forces are being applied at what positions of the golf swing. Now, what I personally believe we should be using this data for is to box players in as individuals. Now, typically what we've seen in the past with technology, let's take uh, TrackMan for example, is we get all this data, we see that every single tour player is slightly different, but what we try to do is we actually try to average all the data together and then come up with a list of positions or numbers that we think everyone should achieve. Now, me personally, I don't want to coach like that. I think great golf instructors don't coach like that. And this is actually the way that we should be reading the data. We should take the data and be like, yeah, everyone's really different. Now, can we start taking key characteristics of each individual player, see how they fit through the data that we have, and then can we start making subset categories of smaller individual golf swings and then start finding where players are relative to those golf swings and then trying to put them into some type of box that's a little bit more defined. I think that's a better way that we gotta coach and keeping that in mind, let's go take a look at Matthew Wiss golf swing and see what really makes his golf swing tick. All right, guys, so it's the time you guys have all been waiting for. It's time to dissect Matthew Wiss golf swing. In this particular part, we're going to be talking about when and how he's using vertical, horizontal, and torque forces. We're also going to talk about certain swing mechanics in terms of how he's pushing the ground to utilize these forces. And then also, I want to give you guys a brief little um, explanation of Dr. Lin, who he is, what he's doing for torques and forces in the ground, and why you guys should go check him out. So let's go start with Dr. Lin. So Dr. Lin basically, as you can tell, is a doctor and he studies a bunch of professional golfers as well as amateur golfers of all different levels and he kind of sees how they're using the ground to get their swing done. Now, what Dr. Lin has done is he's actually gone to Oklahoma State and has measured Matthew Wolf's golf swing on Swing Catalyst. And that's, this is basically where I'm getting a lot of my numbers from, is from his measurement of that time. Now, some key things to think about, when he measured Matthew Wolf, what they did was they put like a little carpet on top of the swing catalyst and Velcroed it down. Now, when Matthew Wolf was making his golf swing, he actually applied so much torque force that the mat actually ripped off its Velcro and moved and shipped, shifted when Matthew Wolf was making his golf swing. So. Some of the num numbers that he got were actually probably not as accurate as they could be. More specifically, the torque numbers had this huge little downfall around, right around position five, it had a huge downfall, even though Dr. Lin told us that he thinks that it actually probably would have continued to raise and hit a peak a little bit later on if the mat had not shifted, right? So when I'm talking about these numbers, I'm talking about all this, that's essentially where I got the information is. I got it from the data that Dr. Lin came up with. So let's go hop into the backswing and start breaking down some misconceptions. All right, the first misconception that we have with the golf swing in terms of ground reaction forces or using the ground is a lot of players think at the top of the swing, you should have 100% of pressure into the trail instep. 
Now, when we measure tour players, we actually find that they're pretty much all over the place. Some, some of them are at 100% at the top of the swing. Very, very rare though. That's actually a rare case. But most of them are actually already pushing pressure into the lead foot at that particular point in the golf swing. And we're actually seeing that a lot of players get the most amount of pressure into their uh, trail foot right around lead arm parallel. And Matthew Wolf is definitely uh, not dissimilar to this. So we take Matthew Wolf up to lead arm parallel, which is right around here. This is pretty much where he has the most pressure into the trail foot and it's roughly right around 86%. Now again, at this lead arm parallel position, some tour players are at 100%, some tour players are at 60%, but again, Matthew Wolf is at 86% at this particular position. Now, taking Matthew Wolf up from lead arm parallel to the top of the swing, there's a very important move that starts happening from lead arm parallel to the top of the swing, and it's actually how he's using horizontal ground force. So from lead arm parallel to the top of the swing, he's actually pretty much peeking out or getting the most horizontal ground force that he's gonna use throughout the whole golf swing. To give you guys a little example, pretty much from lead arm parallel to the top of the swing, he goes from 80% pressure into the trail foot to all the way to 44% pressure in the trail foot and he has about 56% pressure into the toe of his lead foot. Now a lot of you guys are gonna look at this position at the top of the swing and be like, Coach Mike, it looks like he has no pressure on that lead foot because the heel is off the ground and you guys would actually be incorrect. If we measured his swing and you actually look at the data, again, he does have around 56% of pressure into that lead toe at this particular point in the golf swing. And actually that motion in itself is gonna set up the transition move that is, I think, very unique and definitely one of the ways that I think Matthew Wolf gets a whole bunch of torque force a little bit later in the golf swing. So let's go dissect that transition move. So again, as we get up to the top of the swing, Matthew Wolf is right around 56% pressure into the lead toe, 44% pressure into the trail foot. Now from this position to about this position, what you can see very clearly is that heel goes from off the ground and plants back on the ground. Now what essentially he's doing with both feet in this position or in that motion was with the trail foot, he's actually pushing away from the golf ball with his trail foot, and the ground is pushing him this way. And then with his lead foot, he's actually pushing towards the golf ball, and then the ground is pushing him away from the golf ball. Those two moves together with both feet is creating a torque force or rotational force, which is allowing him to really open up his hips at this particular point in the swing. So pretty much from here, so about probably right around here or just past this position is when he's actually peaked out on the amount of torque force and vertical force in his golf swing. So again, as his feet are pushing this way with his lead foot and this way with his trail foot, they're also at the same time pushing kind of upwards at first, right after pretty much right about here it starts to push upwards and then this is pretty much when you're starting to see the peak vertical force in his golf swing is right before impact again that's that jumping motion that everyone sees right here and that's pretty much when and how he's using his vertical and torque forces so again pretty much from here to about here he's peaking out on his torque forces right pushing the ground with the lead foot that way this way with the trail foot and then from this position into here here, this is really when you're starting to see the peak of the vertical ground forces and he's really starting to jump and use the ground to get some extra speed and do all of that. So now, now that you guys have kind of learned um, why or when this is happening, let's kind of talk about why I personally believe this is happening. Personally, the reason why I think that Matthew Wolf is doing this is partially because his coach is telling him to do this and another reason why is because I think it matches up his golf swing and makes his golf swing work and let me kind of explain what I mean. So typically George Gankis is known for teaching a swing that has less horizontal push. Now this is not always the case. I've actually seen him teach players have more horizontal push but again I think for players like Matthew Wolf who really don't need a lot of horizontal push because of certain facets in his golf swing, top of swing position, etc. This is why he's teaching less of a horizontal push to these players. So now, just like I just said, I think because he's so cross at the top of the swing, if Matthew Wolf had a lot of horizontal push before, like a later in the golf swing around position five, he's still pushing quite a bit and he's peeking out on that horizontal foot push. I think he'd get incredibly stuck and I think he'd be incredibly steep. And again, I don't think he'd be a very effective driver. 
So what I think Matthew Wolf is doing, because he's so cross and he needs time to get that club shaft laid out, like we talked about in the previous video, is I think from basically lead on parallel to the top of swing, he gets a lot of pressure into the lead foot from here, but then in transition, again, remember, he starts to actually push the pressure back away as he's pushing forward this way with this foot, this way with the other foot, and that pushes him away from the golf ball, which then gives him more time to shallow the club and get the club head coming from the inside to where he can actually strike the golf ball from an inside pattern and not be super steep and across the golf ball essentially, right? So it's a matchup of ideas. So should you swing like Matthew Wolf? Well, it depends if you wanna have his top of swing position, right? If you're not as crossed as Wolf, it might be okay for you to get maybe a little bit more horizontal push, right? Or you might get that peak, instead of it being at the top of the swing peaking out, maybe it's a little later in the golf swing, it's peaking out. Again, it's all about matching up with where you currently are with your golf swing, what your body is capable of doing, your physical limitations, and then being able to use the ground the way that you personally should use, right? And essentially, that is matchups, right? Now, if you don't know how to do that, what I want you guys to do is check out the link in the description. Again, we're having a seminar on matchups. In this seminar, we're having a lot less people this time. We're only having 10 people per day because I want to give you guys more time with me and I want to create an individual matchup game plan for your golf swing, right? So when you leave this seminar, every single person is going to have a slightly different game plan of what type of swing mechanics they need to change. And if you guys are really interested in getting the correct swing mechanics, the correct matchups for you, you got to check out the seminar. You got to get it. Remember, spots are going to be going very, very quickly. So make sure to go hit that link and get everything done. But anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to smash that like button, subscribe, leave a comment, share it to your friends if you guys think it's valuable. And I'll see you guys next time for part three.